Welcome to Surviving Society. Welcome to the Surviving Society Spotlight series. This episode is on paradoxical representation and ethnic minority conservatisms. I'm Dr. Nima Begum, and the guest hosts for this episode include Dr. Rima Saini, Dr. Michael Bancoli, and Dr. Dan Godshaw. I'm Nima, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Nottingham in British politics. Uh, my research is on race and ethnicity, mainly the voting behaviour and political representation of ethnic minorities in the UK. My name is uh, Dr. Saini. I'm a senior lecturer in sociology at Middlesex University London. And um, besides the work that we have been doing as a group on um, paradoxical representation and post-racial gatekeeping, um, I have a monograph coming out and a couple of papers on um, class formation, specifically middle class formation across British ethnic minority diasporas, specifically the British South Asian population. I'm uh, Dr. Michael Bencole. I, like Rima, do research on race, racism and political representation. That's kind of where my research focuses. Uh, uh, yeah, so looking forward to having a chat about this research today. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Godshaw. Um, I'm a lecturer in criminology at the University of Bristol. Um, my research broadly is, is about borders and bordering. Um, uh, I've done a lot of work on immigration detention uh, in the UK, um, particularly looking uh, at the various forms of harm that, that, that detention inflicts on, on, on people who are detained, um, but also looking at that through the lens of race, racialization, and, and, and gender, and particularly masculinities. So in this episode, we will be discussing our co-authored work, uh, which is called Skin Folk But Not Kin Folk, question mark, paradoxical representation and post-racial gatekeeping among ethnic minority conservative political elite actors. Our other co-author, Dr. Shadia Briscoe Palmer, was unable to join us for the recording. Uh, Shadia is an expert on race, gender, and black masculinity, so please do check out her work as well. Uh, so I'm going to start by turning it over to Mike. Yeah, so I guess the kind of context of this paper is important. Context is looking at diversity in politics. And we've been we've been on quite a journey since 1987. So the kind of first four minority MPs elected in the post-war period were all Labour MPs, right? So there were, it was Bernie Grant, it was Keith Faz, it was Paul Boateng, it was Diane Abbott, right? Four Labour MPs elected um, at that election. Now that election and that kind of their victories were the culmination of years and years of kind of grassroots activism in the Labour Party. Um, and really for quite a few general elections, what happens is Labour are the overwhelming party of ethnic minorities, right? So we see in 2001, for example, they get 12 minority MPs elected and the Conservatives get zero. So that's as recently as 2001, right? That's in recent memory, the Conservatives have zero minority MPs. But then what happens after 2005 or other election feat for the Conservatives is David Cameron becomes leader of the party, right? So at that point, the party have two minority MPs compared to Labour's 13. But Cameron wants to modernise the party. He wants the party to kind of look more like Britain. He wants to reach out to Black and Asian voters. And one of the ways he sees that as being a, a, a possible is by promoting more Black and Asian candidates. So what happens in 2010 is, you know, he kind of plays a really central role in candidate selection. And, uh, you know, quite a few prominent Asian MPs and, and kind of ethnic MPs for the Conservative Party are elected in 2019. So someone like Priti Patel, who's served as Home Secretary, she was part of that 2010 cohort. And what happens kind of following that is this real norm across both parties when it comes to diversity. So, you know, what we've seen in kind of a general election since 2010 is just the incremental growth of minority MPs. We've, we've gone from 27 and um, following the kind of 2010 election, following David Cameron's first election um, when he was a Conservative leader, you fast forward to the most recent election, um, it's, it, after that election it was 65, and we've had kind of three by-elections since then that have made you know, the number go up to 68. So we have now quite a few minority MPs across both parties. And I think the key thing is the kind of normal across both parties now. It was mainly Labour that had a monopoly for you know, quite a number of years after the kind of 1987 victory. The Conservatives has since caught up and the Lib Dems are now to kind of put in their own MPs on the table too. I think they have two um, MPs and I think quite a few will stand up at election, the election this year. So I think what's what's happening is there's a, the kind of mainstreaming of the norm across all parties in this country that diversity is important in some ways. But I think certainly across all parties, there's an entrenched norm that diversity is something at least worth pursuing, if not for strategic reasons, 
for some kind of moral reasons as well, that there, there is a need to be diverse. According to the latest census figures, um, ethnic minorities now make up around 18% of the population, so they thrive to reflect the population who's been seen across the political parties. Also notably, we now have Prime Minister of Colour, we've had ethnic minorities in high office. Uh, so I want to turn over to Dan. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, f- the first point I want to make, which is something that that wasn't in the paper, but I, I guess is, is is the kind of backdrop to all of this, um, is that, you know, current policies being enacted by by um, conservative politicians from ethnic minority backgrounds are set within, um, you know, a much wider history uh, of um, immigration controls in Britain, which are really intimately tied to the development of capitalism and of colonialism. You know, this 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 can be traced back to um, the vagrancy laws and the poor laws um, in Britain. Um, the transformation from slave labor to coolie labor to migrant labor and the regulation um, of that labor. Um, and then also um, various policies that came into force after um, World War II. Um, and the exploitation of labor from the Commonwealth that followed that. Um, so the current kind of hostile environment um, it, it is sort of built on the back of these legacies. And I think also another thing, another point to, uh, another point to make is that the hostile environment, you know, c- can be uh, traced back um, as well. The sort of outsourcing, the deputization of um, immigration controls um, ca- has, has echoes in the 1970s, where various aspects of the immigration system began to be outsourced, privatised, um, and particularly to um, the time of the new Labour government. Um, which saw, um, you know, a massive expansion in in, in some forms of um, border controls, in, including um, particularly immigration detention. But also, there was a clear, um, uh, there was a clear kind of um, uh, uh, directive, I suppose, to um, to create. I think what uh, in two thousand and seven in the in the new Labour um, immigration strategy to create what they called an increasingly uncomfortable environment so um you know bringing that through to the to the coalition government and then Theresa May's government there uh, which that that then found its kind of explicit form in 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 the hostile environment um strategy pivot point we have 2018 um the Windrush scandal um and I think what's quite interesting is that you know at that point um you know Amber Rudd was forced to resign because of that scandal which came about as a result of these hostile environment policies um but it was at that point that we then have a succession of home secretaries from ethnic minority backgrounds you know despite the problems that were very clear through the Windrush Windrush scandal have continued to um entrench uh the hostile environment and you know make these make immigration policy increasingly not just hostile but harmful um so there's um Sajid Javid who you know immediately called for crackdowns on 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 low skilled um, migration after Brexit um suggested uh, you know one I th- in, as far as i know was the first home secretary to, to to suggest um not allowing asylum claims for people who have come um by uh by irregular means by by small boat for for example i think he was specifically re- referring to people who crossed the channel Sajid Java continued Amber Rudd's um, focus on denaturalization. Um, there's obviously the Shamima Begum case. Priti Patel t- took over from Sajid Javid, um, introduced the UK border strategy um, in, in 2020, basically sought to um, increase electronic surveillance for, for, for migrants through, through introductions of various um, digital measures um, and collection of more biometric data. Um, there's the Nationality and Borders Act in, in 2020, which essentially introduced this kind of two-tier um, immigration system, uh, sorry, asylum system, um, uh, which meant that uh, uh, people who arrived by irregular means um, received less protection and it also made it harder for people to claim refugee status. They needed more evidence. Um, and then, of course, we have the UK-Rwanda um, Migration and Economic Development Partnership. Um, which started in 2022, um, which sought to um, provide a way for the UK government to um, remove people who who uh, arrived 
uh, in the UK by by regular means, particularly via small boats um, on the channel. Um, and then, of course, we have Suella, uh, Suella Braverman. Um, and um, as well as dropping key commitments that, that, that came out of the Windrush scandal, obviously has made various comments about the Rwanda uh, scheme being her dream, her obsession, um, and this culminated in the uh, in the Illegal Migration Act of 2023, which aimed to uh, stop the boats, which was a phrase borrowed um, from Tony Abbott's um, Australian government, uh, uh, um, in fact, I think election campaign, um, which created a duty to deport um, and detain um, people who arrive, um, in their words, by illegal and dangerous uh, means. Um, so, you know, many um, uh, people have commented that this basically amounts to a refugee ban. The UNHCR says that the legislation contravenes um, international human rights law um, and effectively amounts to, to this uh, ban on asylum. Um, and undermines global um, efforts uh, at international protection um, of refugees. And you know, another thing we we do in the paper is we point out that that um, that this also has particular effects, um, at least in 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 the form um, that the legislation was in um, when it was at the uh, the bill stage. Um, that it exposed traffic um, trafficking victims um, to detention and potentially more violence. Um, it made it more easy. Uh, it made it easier for um, pregnant women to be detained and deported. Um, and also, there's this kind of focus on on um, and sort of vilification of um, uh, of particularly uh, Muslim men um, who are seen as as um, dangerous and bogus, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Patel was was found to have misled Parliament um, on a series of claims uh, about channel crossings in in 2022, um, including uh, saying that 70 percent of people crossing the channel are single male economic migrants who elbow women and children to the side. Uh, Braverman also claimed that they pretended to be um, children on a on a regular basis. And of course, now we've got James, James Cleverly, who is, you know, continuing to try and make the the, the Rwanda scheme happen. Great. Thank you, Dan. I think that really um, sets the context for uh, the paper and particularly this question of restrictive immigration policies being formulated by ethnic minority politicians um, who are the children or uh descendants of migrants. Um, Priti Patel famously said that her own parents would not have been allowed into the UK under her immigration rules. Um, but uh, I think we'll speak to immigration policy a bit later, but I just wanted to turn over to Rima. Um, could you say a bit more about what we mean by post-racial gatekeeping? Yeah, so I think Mike and Dan have really sort of laid out bare the historical, the policy and sort of the political um, movements, non-linear movements, but definitely more recently lurches to the right, specifically in relation to um, immigration policy and immigration discourse. As sociologists and political scientists, the first thing we're going to want to do is try and understand um, how this links to theory or, or try and um provide some sort of theoretical context or framework um, to what's going on. Um, and so we sort of drew on kind of two related concepts in this paper. Um, and these uh, build on in some respects um, from a paper that um, Nima and Mike and I wrote, which was an analysis of the 2022 um, leadership, uh, conservative leadership campaign. Um, to sort of understand, um, in that sense, sort of more the the discourse, um, particularly the appeals to kind of Britishness and British values that ethnic minority conservatives seem to be um, latching onto and repeating and reproducing at quite a phenomenal rates during the campaign, and more so in this um, recent paper to um, the actual uh, far right. Uh, racist and sexist and intersectionally sort of damaging and oppressive policies um, that they are laying claim to and defending. Um, so the first concept, post-racialism, um, is, is something that um, has uh, been given a lot of theoretical attention in the US, particularly amongst scholars such as Eduardo Benilla-Silva 
And it speaks to the um, the political space that we're in right now, um, whereby um, it's absolutely credible um, to claim that anti uh, that racist discourse and racist policy is effectively anti racist or at best completely neutral. Um, so it's essentially taking or ignoring the racial content and the racist content um, of sort of all the kinds of um, policy movements and policy decisions that Dan was was laying out previously. Um, the gatekeeping idea of it is how that is enacted in person by individuals. So the concept of gatekeeping isn't new. Um, it was something that um, has been discussed a lot in US scholarship, particularly by um, sociologists such as Elijah Anderson, who talks about um, the role of um, sort of black people in white spaces uh, seeking to manage or minimize the credibility gap between white people um, and, and black people and uh, sort of uh, trying, I guess, to um, uh, not necessarily ignore, um, but trying to minimize the negative racial stereotypes uh, that are applied to them in those spaces and essentially um, eking out um, or minimizing the the charged racial atmosphere in these spaces. We can also link it to um, concepts such as bordering and the everyday bordering um, that uh, people of color regularly engage in, whether it's um, brown, black, Asian um, uh, workers, airport security workers, for example, who are manning the visa desks um, at Heathrow Airport, to all of those who, um, we could say ethnic minorities who will vote for policies or support policies or not even challenge policies um, that would ostensibly um, undermine or harm people that look like them or maybe even people um, that are within their own communities. And Nima, you mentioned Preeti Patel, for example, um, saying somewhat hypocritically and somewhat paradoxically, um, and you'll talk about paradoxical representation that her own sort of family um, would perhaps have been um, affected by some of the anti-immigrant policies um, that we've been seeing floating around recently. The idea of a post-racial gatekeeper in the context of contemporary conservative politics is sort of exponential at the moment. So we're seeing our own prime minister, we're seeing our own senior members of cabinet um, over the last year or so who are... Um, not only supporting, but reproducing and really vehemently um, uh, supporting and doubling down on um, sort of incredibly uh, racializing policies. Um, and these are, as I said before, intersectionally damaging and intersectionally oppressive. And so it's not just um, individuals such as Rishi Sunak and David Lammy. Um, uh, this is cross party as well, can I say. Um, but uh, Suella Braverman and Preeti Patel, um, who are um, essentially, one could say, um, working against, this is quite a controversial concept, potentially working against the interests of those um, within their own ethnic or ethno-racial communities, um, but also sort of not understanding how these policies are harmful for women of colour as well. Um, not necessarily in any sort of direct way, shape or form, but in the um, in the larger and broader move that we're seeing in the far right um, towards uh, sort of the most vulnerable members of society, particularly um, refugee women, for example, um, and how these um, anti-immigrant policies really uh, undermine and, and affect them negatively. Um, so it was within this um, sort of theoretical context around post-racial gatekeeping um, that we sort of sought to understand in this paper how um, the politics and the policies of conservative ethnic minority politicians work. Um, in the paper, we uh, give a few examples of how this happened in practice. Um, I mean, I can cover some of those. Or Nima, do you want to bring some of them up? Um, I was thinking specifically around some of the um, comments that Kemi Badenoch and Preeti Patel, for example, have made. Um, around uh, Black Lives Matter, um, around um, the teaching of diversity and equality in schools, for example, um, and then more notably in sort of uh, the policy and legislation area, the illegal migration bill, so things that we have touched on a little bit already. Um, so Nima, shall I, shall I pass it back to you? Do you want to talk a little bit about paradoxical representation? 
kind of following on from what we talk about in terms of post-racial gatekeeping, this uh, denial of um, racism and the impacts of racialization on racially minoritized communities. Um, and uh, so we also talk about this concept of paradoxical representation. Um, so uh, Mike's work really speaks to the different types of representation. Um, and usually we look at descriptive representation, so the extent to which um, uh, representatives uh, reflect the characteristics of the population. And then substantive representation usually refers to the extent to which uh, representatives uh, act in the interests of the group that they descriptively represent. So do uh, women uh, politicians uh, make policies that um, would benefit women? Do minorities make, uh, minority politicians make uh, policies and act in the interests of minority communities. Um, so we've um, considered this concept of paradoxical representation that in this case, or what we've been talking about in terms of immigration policy and so on, um, minority politicians may be actively acting against the interests of uh, minority communities um, and how we consider these interests can be debated, um, but there is political currency, there is um, something to be said about um, what it means for minority politicians to, for example, make um, anti-immigrant policy or to make restrictive immigration policies that would worth, that adversely affect minority communities. Um, so this is a question I think that we've struggled with in terms of um, how do we talk about uh, the motivations of minority politicians, for example, in the Conservative Party? Um, are they enacting their own political values and attitudes and their conservative ideologies? Or is this more of a strategic um, move within the Conservative Party to get ahead for their careers? Yeah, no, I think I think that's sort of definitely something that we were kind of grappling with. Um, I think uh, it's it's very difficult to know. Um, and I think particularly for myself, it, it was it's very difficult to know where the um, the party line ends and the the personal kind of line or rhetoric um, begins. Um, Although sort of Mike quite rightly pointed out that we've had um, increasing numbers of ethnic minorities in senior positions and not just the Conservative Party, but the Labour Party, um, it's we've always been trying to toe that line of, of understanding um, what the personal motivations of the individual was and the extent to which they are um, reproducing a, um, uh, a party ideology and where that party ideology has um, has developed and how much it's actually driven by those individuals. Um, and I think even though we don't want to um, make any claims about any of these individuals sort of voting against their own interests, sort of not voting, but um, acting against their own interests, because we know that the idea of what ethnic minority interests is, are, are completely heterogeneous, they're completely varied and diverse. Um, I think it's really important to say that that what we're seeing now is is a trend. It's a pattern, um, and it's incredibly and increasingly worrying. Um, I think one thing that I didn't mention was the um, the effect of hegemonic whiteness. I think as a structuring force in both the personal individuals and party um, motivations, particularly of those in in the Conservative Party, and perhaps in other sort of um, sort of centre to far right parties in Europe that have been um, sort of co-opting women particularly, but increasingly ethnic minorities within their ranks. The structuring force, I think, of hegemonic whiteness is um, really the the overarching kind of way in which we can understand how um, this kind of discourse and rhetoric and policy making is constructed and, and creates roles and creates um, opportunities for people of colour to um, uh, 
gain legitimacy and credibility in in really undermining um, anti-racism and undermining all the progress that has been made over decades um, in anti-racist solidarity, um, whilst positioning themselves as being completely legitimate with the interests of their own party and even their own communities at heart. Um, so a little bit of a segue again, sort of what you said there, Nima, but um, I think, you know, we were trying to sort of understand um, how we can kind of link the individuals to the party, to the structure, um, and then to the actual sort of policy and politics of what we're seeing um, in the course of this paper. And I think it's something that we're going to sort of need to keep thinking about and working on a bit further, because there's lots of um, things going on at the moment um, in terms of um, in, in this sort of space. Um, and the spotlight perhaps needs to be put on other parties as well, like the Labour Party, I think. I think just a, a final point on the Conservatives is I think a lot of what it, the likes of Kemi Badnock and Priti Patel do is try and play up to the model minority um, stereotype. So it's the idea that I'm one of the good guys. I'm not like them. I think if you're a minority MP, I think if you decide to join the Conservative Party, that says something about where you are, where you are politically. Because if, if we think about where the, where the Conservative Party have been in the kind of post-war years, this has been a party that, generally speaking, for most of that period, has espoused scepticism towards multiculturalism, towards, you know, the integration of particular groups in society. They have, have been, you know, had some kind of Islamophobic periods as well in, in that in that time. So this is a party that haven't been on the side of anti-racism. So if you are a member of that party as a minority, you are aligning with that politics, right? That's the absolute, that's, that's the undeniable fact of things. And I think a lot of these, you know, Black and Asian MPs in the Conservative Party are willing to do so, partly because they ideologically align with the Conservative Party, maybe on the kind of tax and all those other things. But also socially, I think they've got to a position in life where they feel they're able to de-emphasise their race. So these are politicians who are earning, in some cases, six figures, who have done well before they got into politics, maybe worked in law or, or other sectors. These are people who, quite frankly, don't feel their race anymore and don't feel that anyone else should. So it's kind of, if I can do it, so should you. I'm, I'm a, I've am I'm, made it up to this position. So it is that kind of, this is what the Conservative Party is and, and we shouldn't be surprised that members of its party are espousing anti-immigrant or kind of you know, racist um, sentiment when that's kind of what the party has done historically for the last 50, 60 years, even, even before that. That's not to say Labour are the good guys. I'm sure we'll get on to Labour. It's not to say Labour are the good guys, but the Conservatives do have a clear history uh, when it comes to um, the kind of rhetoric on, on immigrants and the most vulnerable society. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I want to pick up on a few points that you've both made um, around um, the politics of these minority politicians, their individual politics and what they identify with. Um, and we say in the paper uh, that Rima and Mike uh, and I have um, that mm, this isn't false consciousness or mm, we're not, um, and a lot, the criticism would be why should a minority politician align with left-leaning politics or mm, um, is, what, what are we holding minority politicians to different standards? Um, and I don't think that's necessarily the case, but I think going back to this idea of paradoxical representation and the minority politicians who we say act against the interests of minorities, um, there is something to be said about what it means when they... Um, demonstrate their opposition to Black Lives Matter or critical race theory being taught in schools, even though it's not, um, that there is, as Rima was talking about, hegemonic whiteness, and there is, um, there is, those are attempts to appeal to certain types of voters um, and, uh, and a point of distancing from anti-racist movements. Um, so undermining anti-racist activism has is potentially um, a way to integrate into the Conservative Party or um, those are things that we need to look at critically as why do minority politicians, or especially in the Conservative Party, engage in these practices? And then 
they when they are um criticized they will then use the language of anti-racism and say that they're being they're the victims of racism or so there's a kind of strategic um play there that I don't think we can ignore when there is well-documented um, evidence of um, racial inequalities in British society, what it means to have minority politicians in positions of power, undermining anti-racist activism, this denial of racism um, is detrimental to minority communities. Um, and uh, I don't, I think we should be um, cognizant of that, um, uh, particularly when we're looking at um, immigration policy. I wanted to turn to some of the recent developments around um, uh, debates that we've seen on the use of coconut as a um, term of offence. Um, uh, so recently in a protest, uh, a South Asian, a woman of South Asian background held up a sign um, that uh, depicted um, Rishi Sunak and Suela Braverman as coconuts. Um, and she was reported to the police. So, um, and there is a precedent, I think, a uh, case uh, at Brist Bristol City Council of um, a woman of South Asian background successfully uh, won a case uh, against a, a black woman um, who had called her coconut um, and coconut is a hate crime by law and a punishable or calling uh, using that term is a punishable criminal offense. What do we think about this use of coconut in these debates i think my thing with coconut let's let's be clear it shouldn't be persecuted as a hate crime right? i think that's that's ridiculous my problem with coconut is that i don't think it's an analytically useful concept at all because black and brown people have in the past historically been agents of white supremacy i don't think that's anything new and i don't think coconut quite captures that like anyone can be an agent of white supremacy like, it's just it's not just a kind of a white thing so i'm just i'm just not convinced it kind of catches anything useful um it's just it's one of those i think the reason it shouldn't be a hate crime fundamentally is because it's, it's a word used amongst kind of black and asian communities to police one another's behavior and the state kind of I don't, I don't see where the state and how the state can get involved in, in that in those kind of conversations really so it shouldn't be a hate crime but i'm also thinking and one of the problems we kind of have when it comes to maybe um the likes of priti patel Amy badnock sunak etc is we haven't quite, which, which, at least which we are trying to with this research, but we haven't quite developed a language yet to kind of thoroughly analyze their behavior. I think coconut's one of those words that doesn't really kind of capture the granularity of, of what they're doing and, and what they're trying to achieve. I completely agree with Mike, I think. You know, there was, you know, at, at that time, I got a lot of requests to write something or to speak on, um, you know, whether coconut should be... Um, sort of lumped in with the n-word or the p-word as, as a racial slur um and i just felt ill-equipped really to comment on it first and foremost and i thought is that because it was something that my sisters used to call each other constantly when we were younger um which is really funny actually because we all used to make claims that we were all coconuts or oreos whenever we sort of um you know, mentioned liking Celine Dion or something quite innocuous like that. So that was my understanding, really, of the term coconut. Um, and so for it to suddenly be um, sort of garner all of this media attention and then all of this academic and political attention was was quite bizarre to me. I, at first, I read that, you know, the use of that slogan in, in the protest, that slur in the protest, whatever you want to call it, is sort of a little bit tongue in cheek. Um because I think, particularly within the Asian community, we have almost a sort of a, a I guess, a shared understanding, really, of some of these things. Um, we have a shared understanding of kind of what it is to be Asian, what it is to be brown, what it is to be non-white. Um, we have shared memes and shared jokes. 
um, about brown people and Asian people and white people and all of these sorts of things. And I lumped coconut or Oreo, all these terms within that sort of shared tongue in cheek cultural community understandings that have developed over the diaspora within years. Um, and so it was quite strange and stark to see it sort of become a, a public speaking point. Um, and I completely agree with Mike. You know, I just don't think it's anything that really should be um, brought into the framework of legality or criminality. I think it's very much indicative that we do not have that language, that we do not have um, enough um, conversations, enough literature, perhaps enough understanding you know, where and how people of colour come into um, mediate or reproduce kind of the worst aspects, I guess, of whiteness and white society. And that's what we're talking about with the like the worst aspects here, those aspects that really sort of undermine ourselves in a way. Uh, so so that's that's where I, I stood on that. And that's what I felt about that. I don't know whether uh, like Dan had any kind of feelings uh, around that event as well. I absolutely don't think that it should be um, uh, prosecuted as a hate crime. The idea that that, um, that that kind of speech would be criminalised as a hate crime, I mean, M Mike's already made the point that that this is generally um, a term used in black and brown communities to sort of police behaviour within those communities. So as as such, it's a term that's going to be used, it, it's, a, it's a crime that is primarily going to be used to criminalise people from those communities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I certainly don't think we need um, more of those kinds of uh, crimes um, being prosecuted. Uh, we already have enough of them as, as it is. Whether or not um, I think it's kind of useful analytically, I, I, I would also just tend, tend to, to agree with what's been said already. I don't think it um, captures the complexity of what's going on. Um, I think, you know, a term like um, hegemonic whiteness um, does a better job of that. That said, I, you know, I, th I, th I think it can clearly have its uses as well. I mean, I'm thinking about um, uh, Benjamin Zephaniah's poem, The Race Industry, which I think kind of uses that, 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 that concept in a, um, in a in a way that kind of makes sense and it and it and it and it is kind of it's it's used in a in a, in, in quite a powerful way um but yeah i mean i, I think as a sort of analytic ca um ca category i would um i would agree uh, that, that that it's not particularly helpful you know if if we if we sort of agree that that a concept like hegemonic white whiteness is more useful being someone who works a lot on on masculinities, it reminds me a lot of of the work that's been done um, around masculinities, around hegemonic masculinity, and particularly on on sort of subsequent work um, that's been done on the interplay between femininities and masculinities, and the role um, the role of women in propping up um, uh, hegemonic masculinity as well. And I wonder wh whether there are some um, yeah whether there are kind of some useful links that can be drawn. I suppose the theoretically um in that regard I, yeah and i agree that possibly the the language people don't necessarily have the language to make those types of criticisms and coconut i mean the idea of you know being black or brown on the outside and white on the inside is um i think it's something that is used could be used in jest it could be you could be offensive to some people um but that is language there is, in my opinion, a political criticism, or could be used in jest. So it could be um, minority communities, um, individuals within minority communities, policing one another's behaviour. The idea that this could be um, prosecuted by the law, or the idea of white police officers um, working a case of um, brown on brown or black on black hate crimes is so dystopian. This is an institution that is um, uh, has been mm, criticized as being institutionally racist. Um, and it's the idea that coconut is equivalent to the N word or the P word is really um, absurd and um, I don't think should be punishable as a criminal offense. And I think it goes back to this idea of post-racialism that Rima was talking about um, and the kind of post-racial gatekeepers pushing this idea that we now live in a post-racial world 
um, where race does not have an influence. How, uh, this supposed world, words like coconut are equivalent to the N-word or the P-word, and it erases histories of enslavement, colonialism, why those um, particular terms, uh, why particular terms are offensive and speak to, um, like the N-word, uh, speak to centuries of oppression um, and that they're not equivalent to a word like coconut, um, but the kind of strange turn of events that coconut is somehow cast, at, uh, um, has been cast as a hate crime. Uh, so um, just uh, finally, just uh, wanted to bring us back to immigration policy. What does it mean to have immigrants or children of immigrants formulating um, anti-immigration or anti-refugee um, policy um, and these restrictive immigration policies? What do you think are the implications of that? One of the big implications is they can avoid kind of mainstream accusations of racism. So Suella Bravman the other day says multiculturalism has failed in this country and we have people coming and living parallel lives. That's very unit power, right? But if a white politician said that, there'd be probably far more widespread condemnation than it was for Suella Bradman. But because she's an Asian woman, she can get away with those kind of comments. So I think what's going to happen is, and what has already happened, is I think it allows these, these politicians to push these really aggressive stances on issues of race and racism and avoid any most accusations of, of, of racism. Now, I, I kind of have a prediction for 2024 that I think the year will end with Kemi Badenoch as the leader of the Conservative Party. And I think that's bad news for all involved because I think unlike Sunak and unlike Braverman, she's got the kind of nastiness of Braverman, but she's actually competent, I think, in terms of like she can actually deliver a fairly persuasive Conservative agenda on like culture wars without sounding like kind of an evil an evil witch in, in doing so. <laughs> um, so I think the more these positions espouse this kind of rhetoric and, the, and the, the danger of it as well as espouse, it's often espoused in terms of common sense. Like, of course, we want these immigrants to settle into our country and adopt our values. It's our country after all. It's kind of framed in these terms of common sense. And, and the kind of positionality as well makes it so hard, for, I think, for the left and for Labour and for maybe like, even for like kind of academics of colour, maybe it's kind of, in some ways, I, again, this goes back to my language point about sort of developing a language to criticise them, but it can be quite hard to formulate like a, a robust critique sometimes because of their positionality. It's like, well, this is a person of colour, they've kind of arrived to a different conclusion to you. Like, are you saying they're wrong? And then we get, we get, we get called, you know, we're saying, we're, the people say we're being essentialist and, and we're kind of, adopt saying that people must speak the same way if they're from, if they're from backgrounds of, of people of colour. So I think it is, it's difficult, I think. And I think ultimately the, the mainstream, I think essentially what might happen is the Conservatives have a lead like Kim Badenoch who's able to kind of gather some momentum um, with this rhetoric um, and kind of build a coalition, maybe of some voters, some kind of like in inverted commas, liberal voters who kind of see what she's saying as common sense. So those, those are my fears um, about where this can lead us. Um, and I, I think certainly, where I think we're at a point now which is which is at the tip of the iceberg. I think we've kind of seen the nasty politicians like Pushti Patel and Swella Bradman, the genuinely nasty ones who kind of take the light almost in, in espousing this kind of anti-immigrant rhetoric and this kind of rhetoric that demonizes particular groups in society. And I think bad and kids from that school of thought were a bit smarter um, and a bit more competent. So I wonder what's going to happen if you kind of mix the masters of a kind of competent politician um, and a kind of competent performer. What does that mean? The implications are quite um, complex in, in terms of how you um, respond to these criticisms of, you know, are we being essentialist or um, saying that there, the, there's a right way of behaving as a minority politician? But I think you make a really important point about what's seen as common sense and the, having minority politicians making aggressive immigration policies, it's almost giving the impression that this goes beyond race. This this is a numbers game or this is common sense. So if even a minority politician is espousing these policies, then that means we need to stop the vote. So there is there is significant um uh, numbers that we need to bring down, or that you know, this is just a rational um, 
these are rational choices that need to be made and isn't to do with race. Yeah, I mean, you know, if we think about um, how completely legitimate and credible it is for any member of the Conservative Party to, to defend, so low taxes, for example, particularly lower inheritance tax, to defend all of the sort of policies that protect and reproduce the middle and the elite classes, um, there is a really sacrificial quality to what individuals like Rishi and, and Preeti and Suella do in sort of basically sort of throw, <laughs> throwing people of colour kind of under the bus in a way. Um, so we can automatically see that there is um, something not just curious, but fundamentally different about um, what what they do and what they say and the implications of that for themselves, essentially. Um, and I've always thought maybe it's just a function then of these individuals and the way that they are, are sort of playing out the the post-racial endpoint of conservative politics. Um, but as as Mike said, we're, we're probably only seeing the beginnings of of where uh, of where this is going, particularly as we're seeing greater and greater numbers of ethnic minorities, particularly socially mobile ethnic minorities, voting for the party and wanting to get involved in centre or centre right or far right politics, perhaps, and the normalisation. Um, uh, and then the, and the increasing credibility of that. So I think, you know, part of it is just waiting and seeing. Um, I think maybe it's my echo chamber. I've never met anyone in my family or my network, even people who vote conservatives, who find Kemi or Suella or Preeti or any of the, the, the sorts of policies that they've implemented um, as as being defensible in it, in any way. But they will always kind of defend their right to say it particularly. So we, I think we're increasingly going to see the invocation of um, kind of democracy and democratic principles and, and sort of freedom of speech and all of these sorts of other um, kind of values, quote unquote, being kind of drawn into, into the discourse. And, and I think uh, as political scientists and sociologists, that's going to be increasingly interesting for us. Um, to sort of unpick and understand, but increasingly more difficult, um, politically difficult, um, difficult to kind of understand what's going on and express it in a way that doesn't um, make us seem like, as as Mike and Nima said, we're sort of essentializing, drawing on this, you know, kind of quite patronizing idea of, well, it's just false consciousness. You know, they know not what they do. Um so so I guess we, we have to see where this goes, but things are changing quite rapidly politically at the moment. There is, um, you know, uh, a real kind of economic crisis that that we're facing and uh, we're not weathering the storm well at all. And uh, I do want to see where that kind of intervenes in some of these policy movements to, around immigration, but also um, how favourable the model minorities who have been in power recently start looking um, to kind of the, the Tory establishment. I just want to end on what is at stake here. And I think all of us here have you know, a family history of migration or refugees in our ancestry. The demonization of migrants, um, people fleeing conflict or poverty, people who deserve our empathy and understanding, um, being uh, demonized to this extent is what's especially worrying um and then and we see minority communities even those who are british born who bear the brunt of this type of anti-immigration um discourse and there is there is an um an alternative case being made uh for migration or migration is a fact and is something that will continue to happen and uh there's uh the kind of reactionary backlash not just against migration, but against rising racial and ethnic diversity, I think is um, what's concerning. And unfortunately, I believe um, a lot of the minority conservative elites are contributing to that. I will end it there. Thank you all for taking part. Um, and uh, thank you uh, for listening. Thank you for listening to Surviving Society. To support our work, you can rate, review and subscribe to host or produce a series of Surviving Society. Get in touch with us via Twitter or Instagram.